So it's, you know, I think there aren't enough incentives within the union movement to encourage, inspire, pressure union leaders to do more organizing. mentioned in a, in a different article of that um, you know, just th- that it was important just kind of for the record that it may seem like the Amazon labor union campaign has kind of slowed down in comparison to the Starbucks workers uh, uh, United campaign which you see new petitions and new election wins every single day where you saw this one win from the Amazon labor union and then you saw a loss and you haven't seen much else but it's important to note that that one election brought more people into the union than all of the Starbucks workers <laughs> united yeah. campaigns and and elections have combined to this point um so you know the effort that goes into organizing an amazon warehouse uh and and the uh the importance of that win i think can go understated and and that was a good that was a good point that you brought up in a different article and and so your the title of the article that uh that interested me that I wanted to bring you on to talk about was uh, Labor's John L. Lewis moment. And and calling it John L. Lewis moment, you, you're calling back to this period of history in the labor movement in the United States where there was a real focus on organizing and similar to the Starbucks and the Amazon campaigns. It was very bottom-up, very worker-driven. Um, and John L. Lewis really tried to ride the wave. Can you talk to us about that history? Sure, sure. So, you know, there are two great John Lewises. The great John Lewis, you know, from from the South, who was the, you know, very courageous civil rights leader. Then there was a famous labor leader, one of, you know, perhaps the nation's most famous labor leader in the 1930s, John L. Lewis, who headed the United Mine Workers. And at the time, the Mine Workers Union was by far the biggest, strongest, richest union in the United States, you know, concentrated in Kentucky and West Virginia and Alabama, Pennsylvania. And so in the 1930s, you know, part, you know, there was the depression going on, but there was also a lot of manufacturing going on. You know, Henry Ford had really developed mass production uh, in the decades before. So in the 1930s, there were more large factories being created, you know, with thousands, you know, thousands of workers together. And many of them felt that wages were lousy. So, uh, you know, traditionally, you know, American unions, there'd be a carpenter's union and a machinery workers union and a plumber's union, and they'd unionize in craft by craft by craft by craft. So in the 1930s, there was this movement to like try to unionize these whole big Ford or Chrysler United States steel uh, factories that had 5,000, 7,000 workers and like, and have all 5,000 workers in one union. You know, not a union for the plumbers, not a union for the carpenters, not a union for the millwrights, the fixing machines. So, you know, John Lewis, the head of the mine workers, said, that's a great idea. We should back these this big one union for all effort, wall to wall unionization effort, you know, at the auto plants, at the steel plants, at the machinery plants, at the rubber plants. But the American Federation of Labor said, no, we don't like that. These are not skilled workers. We generally only unionize skilled workers. And we don't, we hate this idea of having a wall to wall union with all 5,000 people in a GM, a Ford plant in a union. So basically, you know, John Lewis said, you guys are, and they were guys then, let's face it, you know, you folks are missing the moment. Uh, You know, if, you know, to really have the union movement grow, to keep it strong, you know, we have to back this effort of wall to wall unionization in the mass production industries. So the, it was really the mine workers ended up breaking away from the American Federation of Labor and a few other, you know, forward-looking progressive unions like the Amagrae Clothing Workers, Sidney Hillman, the International Lady Garment Workers, David Dubinsky, broke away and formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And they really fueled this humongous surge of organizing in, in the mass production industries, especially auto, in the late 1930s and during World War II. And the U.S. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, the United Mine Workers really financed the hiring of 500 organizers, uh, to, you know, for, you know, in, in Michigan and Ohio and Wisconsin um, and, and, and West Virginia to really unionize, you know, 
hundreds of thousands of workers. You know, I'll, I'll discuss the South in a minute. But, you know, thanks to this effort to organize, to unionize mass production workers, you know, it's so successful. The United States went from 12 percent of workers organized in 1936 to like like uh, 32 percent, you know, like two and a half times per more organized, you know, millions, millions more organized by by 1946, the year after the war ended. And and that shows that, you know, um, John Lewis really said, we have to forget about this old way of organizing just skilled workers, just in individual crafts. We have to, you know, 5,000 workers at a factory want to unionize. Let's go out and unionize them. You know, let's not worry about, you know, dividing them into 37 different unions. Let's just do it and do it quickly. And there was this surge of, of unionization, especially by sit-down strikes with the famous Flint sit-down strike of 1936 and 37. In my book, Beaten Down, Worked Up, I write at length about how the Flint sit-down strike was the most important, most influential, most inspiring strike of the 20th century because workers won against what was the nation's largest company. And at the time, General Motors was a fiercely anti-union company. And once the Flint sit-down strikers you know, won their seven-week strike. You know, after striking in, in, in you know, throughout the winter in, in, in bitter cold, once they were able to win a union against the iconic company General Motors, and General Motors was you know the Amazon and Walmart put together of its day. You know, once they won at General Motors, that inspired workers at so many other places, and and there was just a huge surge of unionization. At, at factories and store retail stores across the, the nation, and and I keep thinking like the the successes at Amazon, the successes at Starbucks, they could turn into a much broader surge of unionization. I think the interest, the excitement is there, uh, but the nation's big unions aren't providing the resources, aren't providing the legal advice, aren't providing um, the lawyers that could really cause. In the Starbucks, Amazon, Apple efforts to spread in, into other companies, and and you know as as Harold Myers and I wrote in our American Prospect piece, you know the percentage of workers in unions in the United States has you know kept declining for decades. It's down to just six percent in the private sector. So you know if the if the labor movement is going to try to really reverse its decline, really expand, it has to do it when it's still is somewhat strong enough. And if it hmm. allows itself to decline hmm. to just, you know, 4% of the private sector work, workforce, it might then be way too late for, ever, for it to turn things around. So there's this huge excitement among your young workers. You know, there, you know um, there was a poll showing that 77% of young workers, 18 to 34, approve of unions. That's the highest rate in forever. There's another recent study that showed basically three out of four uh, workers age 18 to 24 say they would vote to join a union today if they could. And basically, uh, you know, three out of four um, Hispanic workers say they would vote to join a union if they could. Four out of five African-American workers say they would vote to join a union today if they could. So there is a huge hunger, huge appetite to unionize nowadays. And I think uh, organizers, progressives, you know, um, Democrats, you know, people who want a fair economy, people who want to reduce income inequality, um, and the big unions really have to like dive in and say, "This is our moment. Let's stop sitting on our hands. Let's try to maximize this moment to turn it into a real movement." And yes, that means taking risks. That means unions might spend a million, or three million, or five million dollars on trying to build this moment. But it's ways now or never. And going back to John L. Lewis, he realized that the labor movement in the 1930s during the Great Depression was kind of stalled. And he realized that if the union movement continues to stall and decline, that means even his mighty union, the mine workers, would end up losing power. So he realized that, you know, for my union, for the mine workers union to remain strong, we need all of labor to grow, to, to grow stronger. And I think too many unions now, too many union leaders now think that oh, my union's doing okay, I'm doing okay, I have a good job, and they don't want to, you know, fight and spend the money and, and, and you know, and, and, you know, battle 15 hours a day, you know, to build the labor movement because it's hard, hard, hard work. But, you know, but if you don't, you know, if you don't know it, 
you know, if not now, when? If not now, you, if not you, who's going to do it? It's great that these young workers are doing it, but and 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 you know, they're, they're somewhat self-sustaining, but they need money to spread it. You know, to send organizers elsewhere, to have legal advice, to file petitions with the NLRB, and and I, I don't think nearly as nearly enough is being done by the overall labor movement to uh, accelerate this effort. And the money is there to do it. Let's pull up this graphic, Adam, from Jacobin. There was a there was an article in Jacobin by uh, Chris Boner. Um, now is the time for unions to go on the offensive. There was a figure that illustrated that, quote, union membership declined by over 2 million members since 2000, nearly a 13 percent decline. Union density, uh, the percentage of total workers represented by unions, plummeted from 13.5 percent of the workforce in 2000 to 10.8% in 2020. But over the same period, the net assets of organized labor, the assets minus the debt, grew 153% from $11.5 billion to $29.1 billion. If labor is facing, is facing an existential crisis, it's not reflected in the balance sheet. And that's just, that was amazing to me when I saw that. It, so they're sitting on a lot of money, the leaders of the labor movement are, a lot of these big unions are, and obviously things are going to be different in different unions. But why Why is it that they are, that, that they're just sitting on it? And that, I mean, the fact that, you know, I mean, why is there not a, a, a push to say like, okay, well, we're going to spend everything that is above what we would have had adjusted for population in 2000 and adjusted for inflation, we're going to spend it on organizing. And that would be like, you know, something on the order of $10 billion. We're going to spend $10 billion in the next 10 years on organizing because that's that's how much extra we have, basically. Why are they not doing that? I'll give you several, several reasons. So I read this book called Beaten Down, Worked Up. I think a lot of labor leaders feel beaten down. You know, they try to unionize. And as I'm sure you've discussed uh earlier today with Kim Kelly and others, it's very hard to unionize in the United States. The, the uh, playing field is really tilted in favor of management. And look at, you know, look at Bessemer, Alabama. I mean, yes, the union has, you know, came very close in the second time around and it still might pull out a victory once the challenge ballots are counted. But, you know, I, in my book, I, I, you know, I explained chapter and verse about why and how it's so tilted in favor of management. So you take a unionization drive, man, you know, management can propagandize workers against the union 24 hours, seven days a week. It could force them to attend anti-union meetings. It, you know, it can grab them one buttonhole them, grab them one on one, say you shouldn't vote for a union. It, you know, it is Amazon, you know, I've written about labor now for you know 27 years. Amazon's the first country, first company I ever heard of, and this was in Bessemer that put uh, posters in the bathroom stalls, you know, telling people they should vote against the union. So you can't even sit on a can in peace. You got to read this anti-union propaganda. So, and, and they're in break rooms and, and in lunch rooms, companies show anti-union videos. I once did a big story about the largest employer in the state of Pennsylvania, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. On every worker's computer, the screensaver was, you know, was anti-union stuff you know, about how bad unions are. So on one hand, you know, companies can just flood their workers with anti-union stuff, whereas under American law, under, under a decision by our very pro-business Supreme Court, companies have the right to totally ban union organizers from setting foot on company property. They can't even, in the case where they said it was illegal for, that it was legal for companies to ban workers, uh, an organizer went on company property to put some flyers on on cars, car windshields in the parking lot, and the company said, and and the, and, um, the Supreme Court said the company has the right to ban that. We got to put, we got to protect property rights. Forget about workers' associational rights, you know, employers' property rights, or some. So I think a lot of union leaders say it's you know we've tried unionizing. We've lost too many times. It costs a lot of money. It's just too hard and too beaten down. I'm not going to try it. I think that's one thing. Second, I think a lot of union leaders worry that, hey, you know, in my union local, we have five, you know, we're sitting on, say, a treasury of $5 million. And I could spend a million on that on an organizing drive to try to organize 
5,000 workers, and maybe my chances of winning are 56% or 58% to 42%, whatever. And they'll think, you know, the odds on that are very, very good. And if I lose, my existing members are going to be pissed off at me. They're going to say, why did you? So I think, you know, a lot of union leaders feel just scared. And I think a third reason is like kind of inertia. And then, you know, you know, all these very smart sociologists were writing in the 1950s and 60s and 70s when before you were born when I was just a little boy, you know, saying, you know, unions are great, but they're like all big institutions that are going to become increasingly bureaucratic and suffer from increased inertia. And, you know, if you're a union leader, you know, let's say you had a, you know, look what's happening now in the um, Writers Guild Union, you know, terrific union representing, you know, people who write TV and, and movie scripts. They've done a great job using unionizing journalists, digital journalists, you know, at Fox and Vice. And I think some of the union leaders are like worried, well, there are all these new people whom I don't know. They're in a different industry and maybe they're going to vote me out, kick me out. Like, you know, it kind of their lives can be, you know, a lot of union leaders feel, hey, my life is fine. I can go golfing at five o'clock or, or six o'clock. I don't want to bust my hump. Um, risk losing, risk having these young upstart workers we just organized, you know, try to run against me. So it's, you know, I think there aren't enough incentives within the union movement to encourage, inspire, pressure union leaders to do more organizing. And, and I think they're really structural obstacles in, in how unions are set up that make it hard. And it would be great if the AFL-CIO, you know, the, 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 the um, larger federation had some incentives or, or, you know, coughed up a lot of money or had this big organizing fund to get more unions to organize. Because now so much of the organizing is like, it's up to the individual local leader to do it. Like, you know, Hey, I'd rather, you know, go see my girlfriend at five o'clock or go golfing at five 30 or go out, you know, or very understandably go out to a movie with my kids tonight, then, you know, be, you know, stand you know, stand, you know, be knocking on doors in Bessemer at eight o'clock trying to persuade workers to organize. Right. Right. Jacob, I was going to and, and, and just and let me just say, and, and if it were far easier to unionize, you know, if unions won 80 or 90 percent of the time, you know, if workers could just unionize through card check, we'd see a lot more unionizing because union leaders won't feel, won't feel the same inertia. They'd see how much easier it is. Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic answer and kind of lays out the, the multifaceted issue there of why we're not seeing that response. And, you know, I think the, the, you're exactly right. I mean, the very nature of labor unions as institutions over time, the inertia that sets in the conservatism that sets in, in terms of behavior of leadership. Um, but I think that everything you just described to me reaffirms how important that militant rank and file movement is because if if we can't sit back and wait on leadership to do it, well, that's where we have to push them inside of our unions and outside of our unions uh, to come up off those resources. Um, because absolutely, I think I think what's really great about the Starbucks effort is like its workers are like doing it themselves. They're getting off their you know uh, you know behinds and saying <laughs> I can I, I can do it myself and like. And for their advice, you know, for, to do it, they're not relying on outside union staff organizers. And, and bless their souls, outside union staff organizers, they do good work. They do courageous work. But, you know, so some baristas, you know, who unionize in Buffalo, some baristas who unionize in, 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 in Seattle might, you know, get on the phone or do a Zoom call with, with workers in Arizona or Southern California or, or Louisiana or Alabama or Florida and say, this is how we won in Buffalo or Seattle or Boston. These are the tricks. This is the BS you're going to hear from the anti-union consultants. This is how you respond to that. This is how you collect signatures. This is how you file with the NLRB. And, and people see we could do it. And I think that's very, very inspiring. And, and it doesn't rely on, you know, this union president to like give a green light. Having said that, you know, the, Starbucks unionization effort began in Buffalo and upstate New York, and it was a union leader, you know, the upstate New York head of Workers United, you know, blessed this effort, gave money for this effort, hired one or two professional organizers for the effort. 
and that's what really got the ball rolling. And, and, you know, part of the brilliance of the effort is the lead organizer, Richard Benziger kind of said, we're not going to do this relying on paid staff organizers. We're going to try to really turn it into a self-organizing bottom up effort. And it really, and, and, and that's what it has been. And, and, you know, you know, people often say, and can, can, uh, you know, can workers unionize in, in the South? Uh, and I was in, in, in um, Kentucky when, uh, no, sorry, in, in Tennessee, when the workers, the Volkswagen workers voted against unionizing. Um, and, but, you know, in Starbucks, you know, in Birmingham, you know, Starbucks workers voted 27 to one to unionize, in Louisville, 19 to five to unionize, in Knoxville, uh, 1340 unionize. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just, it shows that you can unionize in the South. You know, one of the things that most surprised me, you know, in Alabama, in South Carolina, often considered the most anti-union state in the country. The workers, you know, in Anderson, South Carolina, voted 18 to zero to unionize. So this kind of puts the lie to the idea that workers in the South can't unionize. It is, though, often harder in the South because, unlike New York, for instance, or unlike Washington State, for instance, or unlike California, for instance, or in like Michigan, for instance, in the, in the South and in Alabama and in Mississippi, you know, the politicians are going to fight very hard against unionization effort. Whereas in New York and Staten Island, politicians very much supported the Amazon unionization drive. And, um, you know, here in New York, you know, a lot of people have uncles, aunts, cousins, you know, who've been in unions and they could talk about the great health benefits of unions or the great pensions in unions. But in states like North Carolina, South Carolina, we're just, you know, two, three, four percent of workers are in unions. Many workers don't have any aunts, uncles, fathers, mothers, cousins in unions. So they don't know the benefits of unions. And, and so, yeah, that's why it was definitely more of an uphill battle to, you know, to win at Amazon and Bessemer than, than, and then in, than in Staten Island. I keep thinking, I keep waiting. You know, there are very blue cities like Boston and, and Chicago and, and Minneapolis and Seattle and Los Angeles. Uh, and I keep waiting to hear that, you know, workers at, at Amazon warehouses in those areas, you know, have petitioned for union election. But it's much harder to get, you know, if you have a warehouse with 6,000 workers, it's much harder to get 30% of them to sign cards saying we want a union than it is to get 30% of the 30 workers in a Starbucks right. to sign a petition. Right, uh, because at, oh. at, at a Starbucks location with 30 workers, you might have one or two kind of natural worker leaders where in yeah, a, yeah. Uh, and, and where you flip them, you get the whole store. Right, but right, right. The, at, you know, at an Amazon warehouse, you're going to have hundreds of worker leaders in different shifts in different departments. And so it makes it a lot, it makes it a lot more difficult. But how, so the, let's say that we've, you know, um, Oh, and, you know, speaking of, of blue cities, I mean, Birmingham, Bessemer, theoretically, is supposed to be a blue city. Jefferson County uh, is supposed to be run by Democrats, but the Democrats um, changed the lights for Amazon to make organizing more difficult. The mayor uh, came out and said, I support the workers who are in favor of unionizing and the ones who are not in favor of unionizing. It's their choice. <laughs> so, so, you know, theoretically, Birmingham is supposed to be supposed to be real, real liberal. But uh, unfortunately, that, you know, we, we kind of right. it shows the lie there. <laughs> and obviously, being in the South, Jacob and I are born and bred in the South. We've always been here. We know, you know, how hostile the environment is here to a particular extent, um, but you know, in listening to your comments and also thinking about the article, back to the article, yes, as hostile as it is, can we sit here and say that it's so much dramatically more hostile than it was in John Lewis's day? Right. Um, and so that's where I go back to like the conundrum of leadership is if you chose to, to run for office as the president of the union, we expect more from you, um, and and a mark of a leader is being willing to take on difficult tasks. Uh, and so I, I I think you're you're you've really hammered it home. There are militant, especially younger workers out here who are paving the way. They're showing we can do it even under these difficult circumstances, even with you know shoestring budgets. So leadership, 
take heed. Uh, if you want to be relevant in the in the next decade, look look around and see this energy and see this success. And, and not that we're asking you to take it over. We're just asking for some seed money. Uh, we're just asking for, you know, let us borrow some lawyers uh, from time to time um, and be willing, be willing to gamble because you might just win. And that, that's what we call for in that article we wrote, that, you know, there's more energy, more useful energy, more useful interest in unions than there has been in a, a very long time. But they need lawyers. They need money. You know, Chris Smalls, who led the unionization drive at Amazon and Staten Island, is a brilliant organizer. But there's just one Chris Smalls. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's great if he could go to, you know, the Twin Cities and Boston, Seattle and, and, and you know, uh, the Inland Empire outside Los Angeles, go to San Francisco, you know, go to Baltimore, you know, could go to blue places and say, this is how you do it. But, like, you know, it would be He's great if he could. Like, he just one guy, but like he has to like help teach other people to do it, and and people have to pay for them to go to all these other cities, and 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 it would be great if these unions or a lot of professional organizers could like lend some organizers to those efforts. But it's you know things are moving. You know, there's some of that going on, but to my mind, not nearly enough. And and you know, you know, one of the problems in the structure of the of the labor movement is like there. You know, if you're a union leader, you don't get many brownie points you don't get a gold star for going and organizing you know 2000 workers at that plant i mean yes it's nice you want to do that you want to expand your union but you know you know and you can feel good that your union has more bargaining power that it doesn't mean your salary is going to go up but so i think a lot of people just figure i'll settle with inertia but there isn't a structured way to pressure union leaders to do more organizing it's kind of they have to feel it in their gut they need the fire in the belly and a lot of young people have that fire. The teachers went on strike in West Virginia and Oklahoma and Arizona. They had that fire in the belly, the Chicago Teachers Union. But we're not seeing enough of it among, you know, some some of the major union leaders in the country. And, and I worry that's going to hold things back. And I'm sure they will say, some of them will just say privately, it's just too damn hard, Steve. You know, you know, we could spend $10 million or $20 million or a billion dollars and, you know, maybe we'll only organize a hundred thousand workers that way. But you know, if you don't try, if you don't take the risk, mm. then there's no way in the world that the union movement is going to turn around. And I think so many workers are frustrated with the huge income inequality, with you know not being able to afford housing, without <clears throat> not being able to pay back their student loans, without having a voice at work to have a more reasonable schedule and be treated more respect by the bosses that are ensure that you know, customers, you know, treat them better. You know, I think, you know, a lot of workers are just frustrated and jazzed and they want to change and they see unions are the way to go. One of the, one thing that was mentioned that, that unions ought, ought to start doing, and I don't know if it was in your article or if I heard it some, somewhere else, but that they ought to have organizing funds or, or relief funds for workers who are retaliated against, who are fired, demoted, disciplined for organizing and, and pay their salary while pay, you know, pay lost wages while they're waiting for the ULP to go through, if it is a remotely valid ULP, because that would be if you have this program with a, you know, with like, OK, you know, if you meet these conditions, we will pay your lost wages. Give us your you know last six months of your pay stubs and we'll match it uh, while we're going through the ULP. And that will allow those workers to, in effect, become paid organizers. And then after you get your ULP, assuming it's successful, you get the money back. And so that's a really good way to, you know, the, one of the issues with labor law is like, okay, you can say I've got the right to organize and they can't fire me. It's illegal. But they do. And when workers realize that they do, if, if they've been told, oh, they can't do that, this is illegal, and then it happens to them and they see no relief from that, that can be really dispiriting to them and to their coworkers. But if they can say, look, I've got this concrete commitment from right. this union, that is really going to embolden them. And that is actually something that is not very high risk because in a lot of cases, you're going to get that money back. And so, right. you know, in addition to stuff like that, what are some of the other things that this that an, a, a renewed uh, ex- expenditures on organizing would look like, and how would how can we structure it like Bensinger did to ensure that there is 
a focus on rank and file workers, bottom up organizing, that it's not staff run and staff driven, because that can actually be detrimental too. if you've got too much of a focus on staff. You know, I've, I've heard some organizers uh, tell me that I should join the union because it's like it's like fire insurance right and, you know, that's not a very good, it's not a very good uh, not a very good organizing conversation and so how you know how do we ensure that that you know, what what would some of the programs look like and how do we structure it in a way that it is I, beneficial uh, so i think a lot of workers just do not know their rights you know they they don't know what a union does they don't know that you know if you support a union it's illegal for the boss to fire you you know it's illegal for the boss to fire you for supporting a union so i think you know, elementary step is unions, progressive organizations, you know, progressive politicians, community groups, uh, uh, African American groups, Hispanic groups, Asian American groups, um, uh, you know, veterans groups, whatever. You know, they could like help educate workers. Like these are your rights, and if you're unhappy with your pay, if you're unhappy with how you're treated, try to form a union, and and you're protected. And this is how to go about it. I think. You know, first step is education. Second, I, I, as we wrote, there should be the formation of like this nationwide lawyers group that provides emergency voluntary legal services to workers. You know, if you're fired because you support a union, that's illegal and you're going to need a lawyer to help get your job back. You know, the National Labor Relations Board is being more aggressive than it's been perhaps ever before in going to court to try to get employees' jobs back as soon as possible when they're fired illegally. Uh, if you if you get 30% of your workers to sign cards to ask for a union election, you have to fill a lot of paperwork. It will be helpful to have a volunteer lawyer do that. If your employer says, well, you know, your petition for union election is wrong for reason X, Y, and Z, it would be great to have a, a, a lawyer help out on that. And um, also, you know, unions that have deep pockets could also help set up uh, social media networks uh, that will ease the way for workers to organize, to get in touch with each other, to zoom, to zoom together. And and you know, you know, Zoom is this amazing, you know, apparatus for unionizing. And, you know, it's like it's great. You know, you know, thirty workers can just meet on Zoom to discuss strategy or workers in, in upstate New York could talk with workers in Louisville to say, mm -hmm. this is how you go about unionizing. This is, these are the lies that the anti-union consultant is going to tell you. And, and this is why what they're saying is, is untrue. And this is how to respond to them. And this is what to tell your coworkers, uh, you know, to rebut, refute what the uh, anti-union consultants are, are doing. So I think, you know, you need more education about workers' rights, more lawyers, uh, more, um, you know, help on social media. And, and I think the, you know, and, and like these people like Chris Smalls and some of the great Starbucks organizers, it, it would help, you know, to send them around the country to explain and inspire uh, workers elsewhere. And, and as, as you said, Jacob, and if you can have a fund that will, uh, you know, help, you know, fired workers uh, make ends meet while they're appealing their illegal uh, dismissal, that would be great too. And, and I think that's what Workers United, the Starbucks union did. It set up, it set a million dollar fund for uh, legal fees and, and to help uh, subsidize workers who are fired illegally. Stephen Greenhouse, I really appreciate your time this morning. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, before we let you go, is there anything else that, that uh, you think would be important to uh, to mention? I, I, once a selfish advertisement for myself. So I wrote this book, Beaten Down, Worked Up. And, and I really wrote it to explain to Americans who know very little about labor, like what the union movement has accomplished to lift tens of millions of American workers, how it went about it. And then I wrote about why, because of the you know, conspiracy of corporations and many conservatives, there's been an all-out assault to weaken unions since the 1980s. And I explained how that has hurt workers in many, many ways. It's caused wage stagnation, increased inequality. We, the United States, though they were the richest world, richest country in the world, are the only wealthy country that doesn't have laws guaranteeing universal health coverage, guaranteeing paid family sick day, paid sick days, guaranteeing paid vacations for everyone, guaranteeing you know, paid parental leave. You know, I was a reporter, economic reporter in, in Europe for five years. You know, every work in France is guaranteed six 
week, weeks of paid vacation. In the United States, workers are guaranteed no paid vacation. Uh, in every other industrial country, you know, workers are guaranteed paid parental leave. You know, in, in Britain, their workers are guaranteed, women are guaranteed 180 days, more than a half year of paid parental leave. In the United States, only 21% of workers have access to paid parental leave. I mean, we're the richest country in the world. Like, this is crazy. And, and in my book, I explain why, unfortunately, worker power has grown so weak in the United States. And in the last third of the book, I really explain how we can rebuild worker power through unions, through politics, um, and and you know through you know other other effort other other efforts you know through worker centers, and and you know one last thing is and I, I just wrote this big article recently about how we all know all too well how precarious our democracy has grown with Donald with Donald Trump and and many Trump supporters willing to you know, throw the rules of democracy out the window to keep their man, Donald Trump, in power, even if he didn't win a majority of the votes. And then I explained how labor unions can play a really quintessential role in preserving our democracy because they can help the small D democracy forces and, you know, win. And, and you know, they can help people in, you know, the, you know, help win in Georgia and in Arizona and Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, and where there are still, you know, where there's still contested races to preserve our democracy. And I think that's another big reason why people should support unions because they play such an important role in in preserving and promoting uh, democracy. Absolutely. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show, and I am looking uh, forward to picking up the book. And I did check. It is available at Powell's. You can go to the union that represents uh, the union that represents Powell's workers, ILWULocal5.com slash support. And you can click on the Powell's book link there and 7.5 percent of your purchase will go towards their strike fund. And, and, and the Powell's the Powell's folks said my book was one of the 50 most important books over the past 50 years. So, like, that was great Hell for yeah. my ego. And that was awesome. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Stephen, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Keep, well, keep up the good work. Appreciate right. it. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project, and you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 